Hello and welcome back to part three of this Learning Mari from Scratch tutorial series. Today we're going to be going through all of the tools and the palettes on the left and the right side of the screen and that will kind of finish up learning the UI and getting to grips with the very basics of Mari and then we can jump into painting and projection in the next video. So if you've seen the first two parts, then in part one, we went through basic UI and navigation and part two, we went through the paint buffer. If you haven't watched the paint buffer one, especially that's gonna be really important with this one because a lot of the tools that we work with rely on an understanding of how Mari fundamentally works when it comes to texturing, because unlike substance and stuff like that, it uses this weird thing called the paint buffer to texture with. So if you don't know what I mean by paint buffer, if you don't know how that works as a concept, then I really recommend watching that before you carry on this video, because a lot of it just won't make sense to you. And a lot of the tools that we're about to look at are to do with manipulating the paint buffer. Cool. So let's just get started, shall we? So we're going to start off with the selection tool, which is a pretty standard tool and in most programs isn't that exciting, but I think in Mari, it's actually one of my favorite tools. So let's go through why. First of all, we've got it selected here. And if you remember in the first video, I mentioned that some of these tools on the left-hand side have got a little drop-down box here and it means there's other ones stored inside. So that's new in Mari something, four point something. And it basically means that it's just a bit tidier. I don't personally love it, but so there's a lot of tools hidden inside. So we're gonna start off with the select tool first of all. Like I said, we've got a few options that we're just gonna go through now. So on the left-hand side, before we were talking about our selection mode in the first video, and basically we can alter between object, patch and face mode. So object mode, I've got the entire object selected. Patch mode, I select just one UV patch like this. And in face mode, I can select some faces. So first of all, I'm just gonna quickly go through my display properties here. You'll notice yours might look a little bit different and that's because I always turn off fill render. So I can change that to always if I want and it will fill it in. Uh, I personally just don't love that because when I'm selecting it and I wanna see the textures, it just hides that for me. So I turn that to never and I've got outline render to select. Just worth mentioning. So at the top on our tool properties kind of context sensitive toolbar, then we've got some options here. So by default, it's just a marquee. So I'm currently in face mode. And if I now drag and drop that, I'm gonna select the faces that I marqueed off. We've got a lasso as you kind of standard. And we've got this little polygon one that you would have seen this sort of stuff in Photoshop. Nothing too exciting. However, this smart select one at the very end, this is where things start getting a little bit interesting. And it's one of my favorite features of Mari. So by default, I think it will have connected mesh. And if I have smart selected mode on and connected mesh, if I click, then what it's gonna do is it's gonna select every single face that is connected to that one that I selected. So you can see the eyes aren't selected and everything else is. If I were to select one of the eyes, it would not select any of the other mesh. And that's because it's only selecting the faces which are connected. So that's a really cool one. And it's really useful because I use selections when it comes to painting and masking to make sure that I'm only painting on my selection and the paint that I'm applying doesn't overlap to other areas. So this is really useful for me. Um, if you've watched any of my other videos, you will have seen me selecting stuff and making masks from that. We've got this connected UV. So I'm gonna switch over to the author and UV view and you'll see how this works. If I were to select this UV island, now with this smart selection mode of connected UVs, it selects everything that is in that UV island. So this is a really handy way to, if you've got really nicely set up UVs, to quickly select bits of your mesh. You'll notice mine aren't too great because I've come from ZBrush. I did a really quick auto UV in ZBrush. So they don't look great, but ignoring that. And then the final one I want to talk about is this orientation. And so orientation makes the most of this angle thing here. So I don't know what it will be by default, but let's just try 10. And this will demonstrate what it does. And basically what it looks at is that angle that I put in and it will only select faces that are less than 10 degrees difference from it in terms of orientation. So if I select this, it will select everything that's really flat and you'll see that where this surface starts to curve, it stops selecting. And I can perfectly demonstrate that on this eye. So I'm gonna up this to 25 and I'm gonna select this eye and you will see here on the edge, this angle here of this next face is more than 25 degrees. So it just ignores it. If I were to now up that to let's say 60, you'll see it's gonna select a lot more faces. So we've got a lot more there but this angle is still more than 50. It's probably about, I don't know, 80 there. So it's not gonna select it. So that's a really useful one. If you just wanna select some faces that are the same angle and stuff like that. If you've watched my camera tutorial series, you will have seen me using that there, especially to select bevels and stuff like that. So yeah, the smart selection inside of Mari is a really, really cool tool and a really quick way to start selecting bits smartly, as the name suggests, and start painting them. Underneath, we've got this transform object tool, and this just lets me move my object in 3D space. It's something I don't really use. I never really need it, so I'm not gonna to touch on that more. So up next, let's talk about the paint tool. And if you've watched the previous video, which is about paint buffer, then we've already looked at this a little bit. I'm gonna select just a red color. 
so we can see it a bit better. And I'm just gonna paint like that. So this paint is currently on my paint buffer. I'm gonna press B to bake it. And now that paint has been put on my mesh. Obviously you need a layer or a node to paint into. And we're gonna talk about that a lot later on. So if for some reason it isn't painting correctly onto your mesh, there's a number of reasons for that, but we'll talk about that in the actual painting method. For now, we're just going through all of the tools. So you have an understanding of what you can get done in Mari. Cool, so that's baked down. So let's have a look at the next tool and that's the blur tool. So this, as the name suggests, blurs the paint that we have. So at the top, we've got some settings here so we can change the blur amount to 200. This is this tool context sensitive menu, which will change depending on the tool that I'm using. We've got some other options there. So we'll move on from that one now. We've got this paint buffer eraser. So we talked about the paint buffer obviously in the last video, but I'm trying to erase this paint on my mesh and I can't. Well, why can't I get rid of paint? In Substance I can, in Photoshop I can. Well, like I said, Murray works a little bit differently and this only erases paint that is currently on your buffer. Because this paint at the moment is baked down, then it's not gonna work. So let me put a different color down here and I'm not gonna bake it. And then I'll jump back to my paint buffer eraser and I can now erase it. However, if I were to bake this and then I started trying to erase, it's not gonna let me. Well, then how do I erase paint from my mesh? That seems really stupid. Well, yeah, it. At first glance, it may do, but it's just a different way of working to Substance and Mari, and we will work out how to actually remove this from our mesh later on in a separate video. We're just gonna go through tools on this. Cool, so up next, we do have a vector paint here. I've never really used the vector paint. We're just gonna move on right past that. So we've got one here called the paint through tool, and I will often call this the projection tool myself. And basically the projection tool works by, we can put an image in here. So I have one in my image manager, and that's why that's come in. And I can drop this in and basically it means I can paint through this image onto my mesh. So let's do that. And I'm painting through and you can see that I'm now painted all these bricks onto my mesh. I'm gonna bake it by pressing B. And if I'm just gonna switch back to another tool so that disappears and we can see what we've got here. So that looks great, it looks really, really good. Um, but yeah, that's what the projection tool does. So you can use that with references of people's faces. You can use that with anything like grime, dirty details and stuff like that. And I'm doing that all the time. It's really, really useful. So I'm just gonna undo that now. Let's go to the next tool. And that's the gradient tool. And all the gradient tool is, is basically a gradient. It's almost like the projection tool, only it sets a gradient for you that you can then paint onto your mesh. So if I were to bake that and switch to another tool, we'll see how that looks. And you can see that that's painted that gradient onto my mesh. So after that, we've got this one called the clone stamp. If you're familiar with Photoshop, you'll know what the clone stamp is. Basically it samples from one area of your mesh and puts that paint data elsewhere. So what I can do is I can press control somewhere on my mesh and it's gonna click that as the source, and then any place that I paint is gonna look here and paint it elsewhere. So if I paint on the other side of my mesh, you'll see it's taking that color from here over to the right. Why is this useful? Well, especially when projecting, often you'll get areas that are a little bit weird. Like for example, around this nostril, uh, it's not a great result because of where my camera was when I was projecting at the time. So what I can do is I can use the clone stamp to clean that up a little bit. This isn't perfect and with a bit more love, I could get that a lot nicer, but that's just a demonstration of what the clone stamp tool can do. So these next brushes here, the Warp Slurp, Pin Up and Toe Brush are all to do with the paint buffer again. So again, if you haven't watched that video, I really recommend doing it. So let's go for this Warp Brush first. So I'm gonna just drag and drop and the way the Warp does is it basically distorts, but it's not distorting anything. Why is that? Well, it's because I've got nothing on my paint buffer. So I'm just gonna clear this grid and I will put some paint on my paint buffer using this bricks because it's a really good one to demonstrate these distortion tools. Um, and I'm gonna go back to this Warp tool. And again, I'm just gonna draw another grid. And what does it do? Well, you'll see it basically just lets me pick points on this grid and move them about. Why is this useful? Well, if I've got a projection that I'm about to bake down, but doesn't quite line up, or I wanna just quickly nudge something that's in my paint buffer, then I can do that with this. So that's why it's useful. And we've got some options here. So at the top, I can change the amount of things on the grid, uh, which basically just changes how broad or localized the distortion is. I can just do that. And I can also clear the grid as well. So we've got the slurp tool and this basically just kind of liquidifies if you use that in Photoshop before the stuff on your paint buffer. Just a great way to sort of nudge things about. Not one I use all the time, but it is there. After that, we've got the pin up tool. So if I press shift, I can drop these pins on my mesh. And then if I move one, all the other ones will stay in the same place, but that one will move. So let's say I pop some over this eyebrow um, to keep that in place. And then I can drop one on top and move the stuff around on top. And that tries to keep that in place. So it's kind of like this little puppet. I don't know if you've used puppet systems in some programs. It feels a little bit like that. Um, but yeah, that's quite a handy one again, just for distorting and nudging stuff around. So I'm going to clear all them. We'll get rid of that. And finally, let's have a look at the toe brush. So the toe brush is a little bit similar to the clone stamp, but instead of sampling a specific point, then this is going to take a larger area. So what I can do is I can just round off an area 
let that calculate, and then I'm able to drag that elsewhere in my mesh. So that can just be useful filling in bigger areas, stuff like that. On, but again, the information has to be on your paint buffer beforehand to be able to do that. Cool, so that's these manipulation sort of brushes. So let's have a look at the other ones. So I'm gonna pop some more information on my paint buffer again, and we'll have a look at this transform paint buffer tool. So if you've watched a previous video, you will have seen me do this. And what I can do is with these tool tips down here, I can translate it by pressing shift. I can scale it by pressing control and shift and then you will actually see the paint buffer and I can rotate it by pressing control. So this can be useful if you started painting something but it's a little bit off center or it doesn't quite line up, then you can just do that. Or if you feel like the resolution isn't enough, you can scale it down so you've got more resolution in a specific area before you bake. So I'm gonna press the apostrophe key and that's gonna reset that. So it's back to where it was. We've got this zoom paint buffer tool which keeps the paint buffer where it is but I'm zooming in and around so I can see it but without changing the resolution. Not a tool I've particularly used but it is there. And finally, let's look at the marquee select. So this basically just allows me to make selections on the paint buffer and it will kind of mask them out. It's got one cool, if I bake this down to my mesh, it's got one cool little function, which is called the lift up. And this is a way, if you have something that has been baked down onto your mesh, you can just define an area and then I can lift that back up into the paint buffer ready to project again into a separate area of the mesh. So I'm gonna clear this marquee off. And if I start transforming the paint buffer now, you can see that information that was baked onto my mesh is back in the paint buffer. So that's a really cool, useful way. If you've painted one detail that you want elsewhere on your mesh, you can just lift it up, pop it back down. So yeah, that's a really, really handy tip. I would 10 out of 10 recommend using that. After that, we've got the eyedropper here, the same as if you've used Photoshop or a lot of other texturing or graphic programs. If I just click here, then you'll see it picks up that color. So I now have that orange of that brick. And if I click this, swatch below that will bring up this kind of color UI where I can change that. So for example, if I want something green, I can click that there. I can type in exact values. I can change my color space as well, but more on color space later on. If I click okay, you'll see that's there. I've got this arrow key, which will just swap the two colors so I can have two on the go. And underneath that, just this black and white resets my colors to black and white. So that's useful, especially when painting with masks because you'll really quickly want to just switch between black and white. I can also press X on the keyboard and that will do the same as this arrow key. Really useful when painting masks. I'd recommend learning that shortcut. Cool, so I think that about sums up all the tools. So let's have a look on the right hand side at this palette menu. So what are palettes? They're basically sub menus with all these other extra options in. It's where you paint, it's where all your layers are, it's where your nodes are, it's where you store images and stuff like that. So I've reset my viewport and I've closed all of the palettes by default. You will potentially have some here like this, just set off on the right hand side and I just close them like that and we're gonna go through them one at a time. Just very quickly before we begin, I should mention that if you don't see this menu on the right hand side with all these different palettes that you can open, that's because this comes with a newer version of Mari. I think it was introduced in four point something. So if you're working with a slightly older version of Mari, you might not see this. That said, you can do everything that I'm doing, just not on the right hand side. If you just go to view palettes, you can open the individual palettes from there. That's how I used to do it when I was using version three back at different studios. So yeah, just worth mentioning. If you can't see this, it's because it's an older version of Mari. Just go to view and palettes. Cool. So we'll start off with the channels palette. So if I click this, if I were to move away, you can see it disappears. Why is that? It's because they don't automatically stay there forever. So you can click this pin button to bring it out forever. And if I move my mouse away, then it stays there. You can also, like I just showed, drag it off and attach it anywhere on your screen. If you have two at once, so I'm gonna click this colors and bring this out. I can start splitting them or I can put them on top of each other and at the bottom it tabs them together. So let's go through the channels palette. So channels, as I have discussed in many other videos, are basically at the simplest form, just a way of collecting all your textures into one final output that you can then plug into a shader or export for your shaders inside of Maya or whichever render you're using. So at the moment, I've got the base color, I've got the bump and I've got the roughness. They're all inside of here. I created them with this project by default. I didn't set these up myself. I usually make my own channels and you can make some here and you can remove them here and you can change the size of them and stuff like that. That said, I feel like the channels palette has been made a bit redundant with nodes because I can do all of that inside of the node graph. So I don't ever really use this anymore, but it's worth mentioning that it's here, especially if you're using layers, then you will be using this quite a lot. So I'm gonna close that one next and I'm gonna go into the color palette. So the color palette is really similar to what I just showed when I was using the eyedropper tool. Um, I can just change my color here. However, there are a couple more options if I were to just pin this and drag this down a little bit more so it gives it a bit more space, then all these other options pop out. So I can change the value and I've got loads of other options here. I don't think I've ever really used this at all. I always use the eyedropper, but again, worth knowing that it's there. So you've got this history view next and this just shows all of the history that I've done in my scene. So if I were to go back to the very start, 
we would see it undo all of this beautiful work. It's going to take a second to think about it. Et voila. If I started doing other things now, it would delete all this. Um, but yeah, it's the same as just editing, undoing loads of times or redoing, only it's a bit quicker. So you can use that if you want to jump back in time a lot. The image manager we'll talk about a lot more when we get to projecting images. But as you saw earlier, I have this bricks in here already. You can bring in resources, you can bring in images, you can bring in tiling textures, masks, alphas, whatever you want to do. It all gets stored in the image manager before you use it as a tile texture, as a projection image, any of that stuff. Um, it just sits in here. So we'll talk about that more later on, but it's worth knowing that it's there. So layers is the next palette we're going to talk about, and I'm not really going to talk about them too much other than I don't use them anymore. Since I learned nodes at MPC, then I haven't ever gone back because everything you can do in layers, you can do in nodes so much more efficiently, so much cleaner and more inside of the node graph. So I don't really use them. If you do want to use them, if you find the node graph a little bit intimidating, there is information out there on them. However, it's not going to come from me just because I don't recommend learning them anymore when the node graph is so much better. Um, so we are just going to move on, but it's worth mentioning that they're there. If you have used Photoshop and stuff before, it's very similar to that. So we've got lights next. So in the previous video, when we set up our scene, I'm just going to quickly pin this. Um, I mentioned that you can set up lights there, but I always do it inside of the scene. So if I click one of these lights and bring this up a little bit, you can see all the settings of the lights. So I can change it. I can turn it up and down the intensity. I can change the color and stuff like that. And I can change the position. I'm just going to reset that. And I can also just turn it off and on. If I click this light button switch here, then you'll see that does stuff. So if I click this environment one, which means an IBL, if I click this on, nothing's happening. So why is that? It's because we don't have an IBL set up. So this will be the only thing that I ever really change in the lighting panel. I just come down here and where it says image, you can either load in your own by clicking this button, or I can click this here and load up Mari's pre inbuilt library ones. So let's just use this. If I click okay, it's gonna load that for me. And now you can see we've got an IBL in there. So I can turn it off and on and that you can see the effect changing and it also disappears. If you don't wanna show in the background, you can either hide it or you can change the blur on it and that will make it a little bit less contrasty. Personally, I always hide it. Um, and then, yeah, I can change the intensity and I can turn it off and on if I want. And you can also just change out to a different IBL if you'd like, just to see different lighting effects on it. Cool, so that's the lighting panel. Modo renderer, don't really use it, so I'm just gonna skip this one. This would be a way if you do use Modo, I think you can use Modo to bake your curvature maps and stuff like that. I always just use substance. So there's no point in me talking about this because I don't have the authority to talk about it. So the node graph and the node properties. So these are two big ones. So if I click this, you're gonna see it pops up at the bottom. I think that might be where they are by default, but if not, then you can, I'm just gonna close it off. What I can do is I click that and I can just drag it out. Oh, come on. And how I usually have it is I have my node graph on the left and I have my node properties to the right. So the node graph we're gonna talk about in a lot more detail in one of the coming up lessons, but what is the node graph? Well, it's basically where we do all of our work inside of Mari. If we're painting stuff, if we're using procedurals, if we're setting up our shaders, it's all done inside the node graph, which is why I wanna spend a separate video on it. It's basically just a visual way of representing a layers-based system. So I've got some paint nodes that I can paint into. I've got these blue nodes, which are merge nodes, so I can merge lots of things together and start stacking up my layers. And then at the very end, I've got this thing here, which is a channel node. And if I were to double click one of these, for example, this merge node here, you can see the node properties pops up on the right-hand side. So I can change the amount that it blends together. I can change the blend mode, all that jazz. If I double click this channel, node, I can see what kind of color space it's in and all that. And I can change that here. We're not going to touch on it too much. And at the end, I've got my shader here and everything is plugged into my shader. Um, yeah. So we'll talk about navigating the node graph, viewing the node graph later on, but it's just worth noting that it's here. And from now on, I'm just going to leave it at the bottom of my screen. So um, we can start just getting used to it being there. So the node properties I've also discussed. So objects. Objects is a cool sub palette because I'm just going to pin this. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it off because usually I would have it here. Since I reset my viewport, everything's disappeared. So usually I would have my object palette here. And this is basically the way if you have a new model, if you have some changes on your model, you can bring it in here. So we've got some buttons. We've got a add object. We've got an add locator, remove object, export object, add version, remove version, and some subdivide and ambient occlusion. So the main thing I'm going to talk about is adding versions. If I clicked here, I could add a separate object and then I would have two in my scene at once. But usually I'm often just working with one object in Mari. And what I can do is I can go add version. Say for example, the modeler has given me an updated version. The eyes have changed or the UVs have changed. Then I can just find that 
to demonstrate this a little bit better, I'm going to use a completely different object just to show you how the versioning works a bit better. And I'm just going to select this camera object that you might recognize from previous videos. So nothing's changed. Why hasn't it updated? Well, because I need to change the version. So if I come down here under my geometry, I've got this version here and I've got this Mari learning object, which is this sculpted face. And I can click now and change the camera UVs. And you can see now it's popped to this new version. I'm doing air quotes, even though you can't see that. Obviously, if the two objects were the same, then it wouldn't move in 3D space. This is because they're in different 3D spaces in Maya. But uh, yeah, if I was just updating, for example, the lips on this mesh, then you would just see the lips change. Um, obviously, I don't want this camera in here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to this version. I'm going to remove it. So I can either click this remove version here, or I can right click and go remove version. That will remove whichever version you're currently looking at. So do I want to remove it? Yes, I do. And now it's going to pop back to that head. We won't talk about subdividing or ambient occlusion. It's not going to come up in this very introduction to the piece of software in general, but I just want to get it known to you that you can subdivide your object inside of Mari and you can also bake a very basic ambient occlusion. But if you want something better, I would recommend using Substance or X Normal or anything like that. Or Modo, I guess. I've never used them. Cool. So that's our object sub palette. So we've got our painting palette next and I'm going to, this one I'm also going to tear off because it's one that we use quite a lot. So the painting palette is a lot to do with our paint buffer. So this is why I wanted to introduce the idea of a paint buffer. That's kind of what our painting palette is for. We can also at the bottom, we can set up our projection method. So whether we want it to just project on the front of the object or also the backside um, and stuff like that. And then at the very bottom, we've got some masking. So at the moment um, you can see with this green icon, I've got edge mask turned on. So it will mask off the edge of the mesh. And we've got other ones, we've got depth mask, blah, blah, blah. We're gonna to touch on those properly in depth in the next one, but that's the painting palette. I will always have it open because it's a really useful one because often I'll be changing my paint buffer settings on the fly, stuff like that. Cool. So our patches, I'm just gonna close these ones so I can see it a bit better. Patches is the next one. This is a palette I haven't ever really used, but you can select your patches, you can lock them, stuff like that. I don't know why you do this, but it's there. So projectors is a bit more of a niche case use. You probably won't be using it as a beginner inside of Mari, but it is worth mentioning that it's here and it's basically a way of importing 3D cameras. Say for example, you have some in Maya that line up with your model and you've got photographic reference that lines up with your model then you can import that. And it's just a really quick way to project from a 3D camera. You can also set up cameras inside of Mari or views inside of Mari, save that and then export them to things like Photoshop if you wanna do DMP or environment touch up and then rebring that back in. So yeah, it's a bit more of an advanced thing, but it's worth mentioning that you can do camera projections and you can import cameras into Mari. And I've used it on films like The Mummy and stuff like that. I had to do a lot of projections and I've used it with quite a lot of digital doubles when I'm touching up faces and stuff, because uh, it's just easier than lining it up yourself if you already have a 3D camera. So we've got this Python console, which I don't really use. I don't know Python, so we're just gonna skip past that. Selection groups is a cool one. Basically, you can import selection groups from your Maya scene, or you can set ones up yourself. So say, for example, you've got a selection, you've used the selection tool and you've got a selection that you want to use quite often. So what you can do is you can click these options and you can quickly run through them um, or you can add a new one at the bottom. Say, for example, you want to set one up yourself that you want to keep coming back to and you can move them as well. You've got the ability to lock them and stuff like that. I personally don't use selection sets that often. Um, I find that my UVs are usually set up in a way where I can use the smart selection tool to quickly get those back. So next up we have the shaders palette and this one again has been made a little bit redundant because of the node graph. Um, I do all of this work inside of the node graph. I set up my shaders here, but you can see here that we've got this principal BRDF shader. We've got my base color linked into the base color. We've got my specular in the specular and I can add different channels here to control the shader. Again, I just link that all up myself in the node graph, but it's worth knowing that it's here. If you're using the layer system, then you do have the shader palette. So the shelf is an interesting one and I'm actually gonna pull this off and click to this aside because there's a lot going on here. This is basically a library inside of Mari where you can save different brushes, different other things to use again in the future. So here by default, it brings up the basic brushes and I can click one of these and I'll now have this brush to use. If I hop back over to the paintbrush tool and I double click this, then I'm now using this brush or I can use this smaller one, for example. And that's a great way to quickly save brushes or use other brushes. And we've got this personal tab here and I can save my own brushes to this one. We've got some more. We've got these hard surface ones, for example. We've got this one. Uh, yeah, there's a lot going on in here. Up next, we've got snapshots. This is not one I've ever used. I've looked into it. I'm not really sure what it's useful for. Um, just because I'm saying I don't know it doesn't mean it isn't necessarily useful. But also on the other hand, I'm a VFX artist that's textured on quite a few movies. 
And so I know I don't need these menus to do my job. So yeah, if I'm not teaching you something, it's because I don't feel like it's worth teaching kind of. Um, so that's why we're just gonna move past this one. Texture sets, again, I don't know what this is used for. Um, I've never used it on a day-to-day -day basis at VFX Studio and as a beginner, you're not gonna be using it. So we're gonna skip past that. Tool properties is another really useful one and it's how we're gonna finish off this video. So what is the tool properties? So basically um, you may remember I've already talked about this context sensitive menu at the top when you're using a tool, for example, if I wanna change the opacity. Well, if I change that, you'll see it's also changing the opacity here, but we've got a shit ton of other options. So we've got things like the flow, we've got the jitter maximum opacity. So if you've ever set up a brush in Photoshop, um, then all those options are here. You can change the spacing, you can change this, you can change that, the rotation, blah, blah, blah. And this is a way to set up your own brushes um, or to customize ones that you're using. We've got things like steady stroke in here, but obviously this is just for the paintbrush. If I were to change to another tool, so say for example, the warp tool, then you'll see there's nothing here. Why is that? Well, because all the options needed for that are at the top here in this context sensitive menu. So sometimes there will be a lot of options. If I go to the projection tool, for example, we've got a lot more options and this is where I add my projection image, all this stuff. However, some other tools, like I'm gonna go selection tool, this only has one option again, and this option is available up here. So sometimes you'll be using the tool properties, mainly I'll be using it if I'm using the paintbrush tool or the projection tool. That's the main time that I use it. Uh, yeah, so that kind of finishes up this video about the tools and the palettes inside of Mari. Uh, like I said, I split these last two videos because there is a lot to go over. Yeah, if you've got any questions, feel free to leave them below. Otherwise you can jump on the Discord and show me works in progress, talk to other people there as they're sharing their work if you want any feedback. Um, yeah, and join me in the next parts of this video series if you wanna carry on learning Mari. I've been Michael Wilde, take it easy, have a great day. Best of luck, whatever you're doing in 3D. Cheers.